repent. Kingdom of heaven is at hand. Not Catholic priest is at hand. And going to Catholic priest repenting your sins, that's Catholic priest needs to repent before God and before Catholic congregation about his perverted, corrupted sins by which the Catholic Church was deceiving people for, for who, who knows how many years. Since the days of, of the Lord Jesus Christ, those Pharisees, that's the Catholics, and uh, those Orthodox, they continue the path of Pharisees and hypocrites. Please understand, repentance must never be thought of as something that we must do before we can come to God. It's not like this, it doesn't work like this. Now you repent, and once you've repented, now you can come to God. Now do you know what repentance is? Repentance... See, this, this group completely deluded. And he, he's telling you the, the confusion. He's telling you that what the, every church is telling. All the con concentration on pointing finger at you and your fleshy sins. You come to church, they point finger at you, every one of them. That's where the church is empty. Describes the act of turning to God. Repentance says, I was living my life walking away from God. I'm going to turn around and now I'm going to walk towards Him. That's what repentance is. And let me tell you, you can't walk towards God. You're walking away from God now by lying to people. You need to turn around. You're preaching this to yourself, troublemaker. Without walking away from sin and self and the tyranny of the self-life that rules us each and every one. That's what repentance is. Now, it's very natural. Turn to God, turn away from sin and self. If you were in Los Angeles, and I'd say, now I want you to come up to Santa Barbara, I don't have to tell you, now I want you to leave Los Angeles and come up to Santa Barbara, right? Because if you're in Los Angeles, you can't get to Santa Barbara without leaving Los Angeles. Well, the same way comes true in the Christian life, right? You can't turn to God without turning away from other things. And repentance describes that turning away. From other things, I can't turn to God without leaving other things. What things do I need to leave? See, these crooks, they're telling you something and they deny themselves what they're talking about. The confusion is enormous, and God is not the author of confusion. One more thing about repentance that I feel I must add here. Please remember that repentance is a word of great hope. Repentance says this, you don't have to continue the way you've been going. You can turn to God. Listen, if you are absolutely satisfied with your life, You've got all the peace, you've got all the happiness, you, you've got all the contentment, you, you've got all the, the, the uh, sense of, of God's work in your life, all that. If, if, you're, if you've got all of that in your life, then fine. But if you're rejecting God and turning away from Him, your life is falling apart from it, then I've got a hopeful word for you. You're rejecting God by rejecting the truth of God. Because God is the truth. And if you don't have truth, you don't have God. And you don't have God without having truth. Repent. Turn it around. Come to Him. Well, that's the first thing that Peter told them to do. 
to do. But verse uh, 37 also tells us the next thing that he said, excuse me, verse 38. He says, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, this was this... Yeah, the religious leaders, he's gonna, he, he's gonna work for the Lord, they need to get baptized. Baptism, baptism is not saving you. Baptism got nothing to do with salvation. But baptism will condemn you because baptism is the promise that you'll serve the Lord with a good conscience and truth and you're doing opposite. So uh, you're not serving God, you're serving Satan. Mark 16. Mark 16, 16, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be condemned. So believing is the salvation. Believing the truth. But he that believeth not it doesn't say, but he that is not baptized is dead. Baptize, baptism is only for the service. If you want to serve the Lord. So he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Believeth not. Believeth not what? Believeth not the truth, the whole truth, all the truth. Believeth not. If you don't believe anything which God says, you're damned. What do you think? You're getting baptized and you can believe whatever you jelly, jelly bean want? Anything? Anything you trouble Mike is telling you, you can believe and you think you are saved because you got baptized. <laughs> You're in error. Baptism will save you from nothing. Judas Carrot. He was baptized and he went to his own place. Judas Iscariot is not in heaven. And he was baptized. Second thing Peter told them to do. And for them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, it was an expression of their belief and complete trust in him. It was a radical thing for a Jewish person of that day to accept baptism. Expression of belief. Baptism, expression of belief. Expression of belief when you telling to uh, summon the gospel of Christ. You're giving the expression of your belief. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. So your expression of your belief is needs, needs to be expressed through the Word of God. What God says in the Holy Scriptures, not in baptism. Because normally, even though Jewish life was filled with... When the Lord Jesus Christ got baptized, that was the sunny day, very sunny. And God the Father said, this is my beloved Son in whom, whom I am well pleased. Why God the Father is pleased in His Son, begotten Son? Because the begotten Son came down from heaven to go and preach and tell him the truth about God the Father, what God the Father told him. 
all all what God the Father was telling the Son, the Son was doing the work here on earth, work of the Father, to tell us the true gospel. That's why God the Father said, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm, I am well pleased. Do you think God, uh, God is pleased with you, troublemaker? If I'm not pleased, how can God can be pleased? And you telling me that baptism is going to save me and save all your congregation, anyone who got baptized, you deceiver. With different kind of ceremonial washings, baptism was reserved for Gentile converts to Judaism. So if you were going to be baptized, you were like saying, I will identify myself as a sinful Gentile. That's how I'm going to come to the Lord. That was a radical thing. For you, are, you are identifying yourself as a sinful Gentile. Right here, right now by lying and telling us nonsense. Jewish person to do in that day and age. And it was a very clear statement for them to make, to say, no, I'm going to turn to Jesus. I'm going to put my faith in him and I will be baptized into his name. Their expression of baptism was simply this. It was a way that they put their faith in Jesus and did something about it. I would say that's the second aspect of receiving God's salvation. Don't you think so? Second and, aspect. And then secondly, put your trust in Jesus. Receiving God's salvation. Where does it say that? See, he's telling you, and he doesn't give any scripture about what he says. It's like he's, he's in charge, not God. He's in charge and he's telling you his perverted beliefs, what he believes. And he wants you to believe what he believes. And if you don't believe what he believes, that's when they will remove you from the church. And do something about it. For them at that mark, it was a very important work of baptism. Now Peter adds in verse 40, excuse me, at the end of verse 39. He says, For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are far off. You see, as they repented and demonstrated their faith and obedience by baptism, the gift of the Holy Spirit would be given to them as it was given to the original group of the disciples. And Peter also said that this promise of the Holy Spirit was given to all those who would believe in the succeeding generations, to the children of the people who were right there listening to him, and, and, to those who are afar off. Do you see that phrase in verse 39? I don't know if you like to write in the margin of your Bible, but if I were you, I would do this. That phrase that says, and to all who are afar off, underline those words and write next to it, me. Because that's you. This promise is for you. It's for all of us who will receive. And Peter piled it on after that. You see there in verse 40, he says, and with Yes, this is the promise to the whole world. God says that the, the promise to everyone around the world, not only to the Jews, but to the Gentiles, and now, you devil Jews who came to hear that you go back to your nations and you say this, this promise in your churches. And the children, that's to the next generation, to generations after. Preach this in every generation. Telling the promise what God promises and telling us 
in the Holy Scripture. Not telling your lies, but promises what God says. The truth of God. Many other words he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Well, you can see the response. Acts 2.40 And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourself from this untold generation. What are you talking about perverse generation? You know what untold means? Untold means crooked and perverse. Perverse generation. So you now in, in perverse generation, you the pervert, Bible pervert yourself. And we need to save ourselves from crooks like you. I mean, I have to save myself from crooks like you, from your charismatic false wives and all other people. They need to save themselves from these perverted churches where drunks preaching, drunk with, with filthy liquor. And how can you deal with those drunks? I dealt with them. All these drunks can do is threaten you with security or police. <laughs> That's the last thing we can do. That's not the power of God. That's wrestling with flesh. See, they can't, can't wrestle with the spirit spiritually. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual wickedness. So these crooks, they can't wrestle spiritually because they're deceived and then they, they don't have any truth. So they've been lying for all those years, so all they can do is just to remove you. So you don't Stand in their way. Here in verse 41, where it says, Then those who. Stand in their way for them to continue. They say, Tanic work. Gladly received his word, were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to. What a tremendous response. Can you imagine how... 3,000 souls, that's David man, religious man, who were dedicated to God and decided to serve and follow the Lord Jesus Christ and serve Him. They got baptized and now they're going to go back to their own countries and witness in their countries, in their nations, continue the work of the Lord, preaching the true gospel of Christ. Amen. The disciples must have had their minds absolutely blown. I mean, honestly, there they were, a group of 120 people. They probably group of 120 people. See, this, this Bible pervert is still continuing with his life. He just can't help himself. Verse 37, Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, this 3,000, this devil Jewish man, they're only approaching Peter and the rest of the apostles. None of them mentioned 120. All 
attendance is to the apostles. No one else. And this crook reading, reading the scripture and his blind, blind leaders of the blind, guiding, guiding the blind. He just can't see it. That's when the gospel began to spread into all the world. And the tongues, all the, those Jews, they were Jews from those nations, from all around the world, spoke in those tongues. Those tongues, other tongues, were spoken and the gospel was preached in those tongues and that's where the then the Bible began to be printed in every town of, the, of those nations. And now in our days the gospel is preached everywhere. In any country you go, they have their Bibles and they're preaching the gospel. So at the beginning of preaching with other tongues, apostles began on that Pentecost and it began to continue all around the world up to this day. That this is the great work that God wanted to do on Pentecost. Now friends, I, I don't discount for a moment that, that the whole thing with the sound of the rushing mighty wind, that was glorious. The, the tongues that looked like they were fire, that was glorious. The, the uh, spontaneous ability to speak in another tongue, man, that was glorious. Peter's preaching, oh, that was spirit-filled, that was wonderful. But once you, this is the summit of it all. 3,000 added to the kingdom in one day, an amazing harvest of souls. And, and how did they receive the word? Those who gladly received this word were baptized. They gladly received it. Now, I want to give some hope to some people. Maybe you think of yourself as kind of a hard-hearted person. You wonder if God is working in your life. Well, I'll tell you, one way you can tell whether or not God is working in your life, do you gladly receive the Word of God? Well, I'm not saying that you like every preacher, or even that you like my preaching. I'm not trying to say that. But can you hear the Word of God? What is God to do liking the preacher? What is God to do liking you? What are you, model there or some, uh, who are you anyway, for us to like you? We go to church to listen the gospel of Christ. We go to church to listen what God says. We go to church not to like you or anyone else. We go to church to receive God's commandments. That's why we go to church. At least by somebody. And it may 
makes your heart glad. You say, yes, that's true. I hear that. I receive that God is speaking to me. Then you should be happy. God is doing a work in your life just as he was doing a work in the lives of these people. And it says, all those who received the word gladly, they were baptized, making this dramatic statement in their baptism, 3,000 on that one day. And you might say, how could you baptize 3,000 people in one day? How could you possibly do it? Well, you know, there were huge resources of water available on the Temple Mount. There were pools and reservoirs nearby. At least this crook is telling about the true uh, baptism, water baptism. Some charismatics like uh, C3 Church, Christian City Church, they were teaching that this is uh, not water baptism. Like I said, I went to this C3 Church uh, College uh, to do one year evening classes um, certificate for, and uh, at the end of the course, uh, one decided um, lift up his hand. Teacher was telling about the spiritual baptism, blabbing in tongues from Acts 2, 238. Anyway, in the classroom, we had a door on the side. There was a glass door. And when teacher uh, start asking the classroom, who wants to get spiritual baptism, that door all of a sudden start opening and the, when, when the door start opening there was a door noise like you know um, squeaks little squeaks like the door getting open and the classroom and everyone just like uh, got a little bit shocked and everyone went quiet there was complete silence in, in the classroom and the door was opening slightly and quietly and very slowly and squeaking. So it like got, got open the, uh, that quarter, quarter of the way and the, and the silence broke. All the students start laughing. It's like they had the feel of Satan walking, the spirit, the spirit of the devil walked inside the classroom. Because that door was closed and it just got, got open itself. And uh, anyway, I believe that as well, that Satan walked in into that classroom and that Satan possessed that uh, student. He lifted up his hand to get the baptism, another baptism. So that student received another Jesus. So the, God says there's one, one Lord, one fight, one baptism. So he, he received another Jesus another faith, which is of, of the devil, and another baptism. So there's one baptism, he received the another one, and that another one is not from God. He got possessed by Satan right there in the classroom. And look at here.
Verse 41. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day they were added, un added unto them about 3,000 souls. This devil Jewish man got baptized, and none of them spoke with the other tongues after they got bapti baptized. None of them. So 120 is not, not present there, and the 3,000 which received the baptism got baptized. None of them spoke with tongues. Only 12 apostles spoke with other tongues. Just exactly how the Lord Jesus Christ was telling them and promising them in Mark 16. So the promise was given to the apostles, no one else. So now you go to these charismatic churches, you're getting baptized, and they, when, you, when you're getting the baptism, water baptism, they blubber over you, they lay hand on you, and they blubber, blubber over you. They're possessed by Satan, and they're possessing you. releasing the Satan on you by deceiving you with this Habala, Shabala, Gabala, Taibutai. And giving you another spirit, Satanic spirit. There were places especially where they would give these ceremonial washings to the Jewish people as they went up to the temple. And I think they probably just used these pools for ceremonial washings. Matter of fact.